So we're an interfaith gathering, a spiritual community that honors all teachings and all spiritual teachers. So we're going to begin this ceremony that celebrates this oneness of life, which acknowledges that all peoples and all faiths come from the one universal presence, which we call spirit. And so let us begin. The Tao, honoring the universal path of harmony and equilibrium the natural way. Shamanic traditions honoring the beliefs and practices of all indigenous peoples, the way of pristine spirituality. Hinduism, honoring the path of knowledge, action, and devotion. Judaism, honoring the ethical path of living by sacred law. Buddhism, honoring the Four Noble Truths and the Path of Compassion. Christianity, honoring the Christ Consciousness as the Path of Love. Islam, honoring the Path of Submission to the Will of God as its highest calling. New Thought, honoring the medical, metaphysical path of mental, mental healing through the practice of universal spiritual principles. Of course, of course our last candle is the healing candle of love, and we invite you in the stillness of your own mind to bring to awareness the names of anyone you wish to be included in this healing flame of love and of light. And, and now that our flames of faith are fully lighted, we move forward into our celebration, realizing and reaffirming that all paths lead to God. Okay. So our inspirational quote today comes from Reverend Chris Ashley. She's a senior minister, he, she, senior minister uh, in Falls Church, Virginia. Ernest Holmes was very good at holding the paradoxes in his mind, creating the genius of the and. He said, it is a popular belief that those who practice this science are a class of people who declare that everything is perfect. When as a matter of fact, everything in the objective experience of the race is not perfect, and indeed is far from being perfect. This popular idea of the practice of spiritual science is entirely a misconception. A religious scientist is not one who assures himself that wrong is right, that evil is good, that limitation is freedom, that bondage is liberty, or that sickness is health. They did not claim that our objective experience is an illusion. But they do make this claim that behind the phenomenon of human and material existence, behind the slow and persistent processes of evolution, there is, as Emerson stated, one mind common to all people. They claim that this mind is perfect and that they have access to this mind. Now, Ernest understood that we can see from both perspectives simultaneously that our objective experience is real and that there is one mind back of all things. Both of these ideas might be held and known simultaneously in order for us as religious scientists to truly step up and create a world that works for all. We can find the and just beyond our comfort zone. When we let go of certainty and embrace paradox, we find the and every time we release our attachment to our old paradigms and step into a new way of being. 
We are being called to embrace the and, and in everything we do as we support one another in shifting our thinking and stand in the one mind. Back to the choir. In our teaching, we posit that we live in an abundant universe. And I get up here and I talk to you and I talk about the, the number of grains of sand on the beach. And I talk about the, the stars in the heavens. And you can't begin to even count either one. And then you think about those stars and you see that most of those that we are looking at as a pinpoint of light aren't a star. They're an entire galaxy and there's another millions and millions and millions of stars within each one of those. It's, it's more than our finite minds can even wrap around. And so we talk about this abundant universe. So if the universe is so abundant, why is there poverty? Why is there people that don't have enough to live? At the same time, we talk about that we are all expressions of the Most High, that we are the expression of that infinite creative force which we call God, and each and every one of us, and we know that the nature of that infinite source is one of love, it is one of peace, it is one of oneness. And if we are all love, peace, and oneness, why is there war? the things that are going on in our world today, why can that be? Well, this month I have, I started off by talking about paradox. And today we're going to delve into paradox. But first of all, I want to welcome everyone. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you for coming out and... Um, and thank all of you, too, that are tuning in, whether live or later during the week. It is indeed an honor to be invited into your cell phone or your PC or however you happen to be watching, be invited into your lives. Thank you. So we have these paradoxes. What do we mean by paradox? Brene Brown in Atlas of the Heart. The appearance of contradiction between two related components. That's how she defines a paradox. So you can see that the things that I was just talking about are paradoxes. That is, we have two opposite things. We have poverty, and yet we have abundance. We have love, and we also have war. So how do we go about embracing these opposites. How do we take both of them in? We go to Jim Collins, one of my favorite authors. He wrote Good to Great. It's one of the Bibles I have for any organization, Good to Great. Uh, I really believe in a lot of the things that he said, but he wrote another book, and it's called Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0. And Jim Collins said, builders of greatness are comfortable with paradox. They don't oppress themselves with the tyranny of or, which pushes people to believe that things must be A or B, but not both. Instead, they liberate themselves with the genius of the and. And so the title of my talk today is The Genius of the And. And I'm going to talk about two examples. And there are two examples that I opened with. We're going to talk about abundance and poverty. And then we're going to talk about love and war. First of all, we live in an infinite universe filled with abundance. And yet we have poverty. Now, and thank you for the, the, the reading, Linda. That was, and it was very well delivered. We don't deny the condition. We don't say that there is no poverty. We do not deny the condition. But what we do, we recognize the condition and, not or, and there is a greater truth. 
Eric Butterworth really stated this well in Spiritual Economics. The word prosperity comes from the Latin root, which literally translates as according to hope or to go forward hopefully. Thus, it is not so much a condition in life as it is an attitude toward life. Considered in its broadest sense, prosperity is spiritual well-being. In 2008, January of 2008, Anne and I went to Christmas Island. Christmas Island is uh, about 4,000 miles due south of Honolulu. You know, my stomping grounds is at latitude 62. Well, that's latitude 2. It's just above the equator. We landed, and I almost felt at home. Uh, I thought I was in Bush, Alaska. The uh, terminal was an old World War II Quonset hut, and their signage was a 8 by 4 sheet of plywood, painted white, and uh, then with black letters it said, Welcome to Christmas Island. But they didn't plan far enough ahead, so... The further it got, the littler the letters got. <laughs> Until you got to the end, you could barely read the end of Christmas Island. And uh, we didn't have a limo to pick us up. We had a pickup. And we all crawled in the back of the pickup truck and went to our resort. And on the way to the resort, uh, we passed what I considered to be some of the most poverty-stricken areas you could imagine. We went by little shacks and they were just made out of straw. They had like holes for windows but no glass or anything. They had doorways to get in but no door. They had almost nothing to eat. They were living basically off the, the, the land uh, once we were in the resort, we we saw the little kids coming out, and they were out into the edge of the water, and they were pulling these things out. My God, they were like this long, and they were like worms. They were their version of clams, and they had a big stick, a sharp stick, and they'd put them on there, and they would get those, and then they we found out later they had big bags of rice and they would cook those worm looking things in with their rice. Um, occasionally you'd see uh, one of these little shacks uh, with a tin roof and I thought well they're they must be the rich ones and uh, Over the course of the week, we got to know our guides, and they were amazing, and they told us about their family life, and they, they talked to us about their faith traditions, and they, they talked about their lives, and I came to realize that these were really genuinely happy people our song, you know, we left up in joy. And those are people who, who loved what they do and, and who they are. Uh, we were there the, the entire week and they did some wonderful things they, to try to make us feel at home. One night we had hamburgers because uh, they thought all Americans just eat hamburgers every day. <laughs> and uh, that was not one night I overate. Um, <laughs> but they treated us so well. Well, the last morning, the head guide wanted us to go fish a flat that we hadn't been able to get to yet. And uh, in order to get there and get back, we had to leave earlier. So instead of being at the beach ready to go at 7, he wanted us at the beach and ready to go at 6. 
So we got up, we did our stuff, we ate our breakfast. They opened, you know, their, their little breakfast thing for us early. So we, we quickly ate our breakfast and made our lunch and we made it to the beach right at six and it wasn't quite light enough to start out into the flats. We had to wait a few minutes for the sun to get just a little higher. Well, it wasn't even up yet, but for the sky to get a little brighter. And as we waited, I happened to look down the beach. And out of a grove of palm trees, a young lady walked out and she, I can't judge ages, but I, if I had to guess, I'd say she was mid to late twenties. I don't know, a young, young lady. And she came out and walked to the edge of the water and she took off her dress, wrap around thing, sarong, I don't know what it's called, but she took that off and dropped it in the sand and she walked into the water and she took her, her morning bath and you could hear her gently singing and um, when she was finished, she walked back out and she picked up her dress and put it over her arm and walked back into the, the palm tree grove. And I thought, as we were on our way out to the flats, I wonder what the evidence of hypertension is among the natives of Christmas Island. I have an idea it's pretty close to zero. I wondered how many natives die of heart attacks. How many have arterial sclerosis? How many of those natives suffer from the things that we suffer from in our society all the time? And then it dawned on me. Who are the poor ones? Those little shacks are designed the way they are to capture the evening breezes as the sun sets. They are designed the way they are. The poor people are the ones that have to use the tin roofs. The people that are better off have got the shake roofs, the, the, the grass roofs. Who are the poor ones? Uh, we just finished our uh, Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life uh, class. Um, and one of the things that we learned is that there are some spiritual principles which we believe in. These are the things that are unchanging. They are permanent and, and they're the things that we base our lives upon and then we have a series of spiritual practices which enable us to embrace these principles and one of the things that we looked at was this very question of abundance versus poverty <clears throat> and in terms of that the uh, with the idea that concept that Abundance may mean, but does not exclusively mean the size of your bank account or the size of your house or the newness of your car or how many toys you have, but rather it's something that is within inside of you. And we've talked about ways to, to access and to deal with that. And there were several spiritual practices, one of which is the law of circulation that when you step into that and you can give, not from a sense of obligation or because somebody told you to or because you have to, but because you genuinely give from the, from the goodness of your heart, that steps in and activates a chain reaction which brings that back to you. And the best example that I can ever think of is one that I've already shared with you and that's Reverend Nancy, when she would sit down every month and, and pay her bills. And she would sit there and when she got her Chugach bill, she would bless the bill, she would write her check and she would be so grateful for that she had electric lights that she could have light at night that she could watch her tv that she could do the things that electricity brings us 
And then she would write her check to NSTAR, and she would be so grateful that she had heat. All she had to do was look out the window and see that it was 20 degrees below zero, and she was so grateful for that natural gas. That's one we can all step into. And, and our center steps into that and believes in that, and we do it. The first thing that we do when we do our collection, first thing we do every month is we take the top 10% and we send that to the home office as a, as a tithe to home office. And then we go further. We take the next 5% and we donate that to a worthy cause around, you know, the state of Alaska somewhere. And for those who are asking, yes, we will have a pledge campaign there this year. And the purpose of the pledge campaign is not to coerce anybody to give or to anything like that. No, 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 Th that isn't it at all. But it is an opportunity for you to make a commitment to yourself to step into that law of circulation. And it doesn't make any difference how much it is or anything else. We do keep track of it. And the leadership council can give it an idea of what we're going to have for you know, revenue for the next year and, and get us headed going in the right direction. But we're not here to try and beat anybody up into giving us money. Um, Eric Butterworth, again, still in spiritual economics. Think not of what you are giving to, rather think of what you are giving from. And thus feel humble in realizing that you are simply giving away to the divine flow. There is a divine flow in the universe. Okay, paradox two, the, the second one that we talked about, and that is how can we have love between all men and war at the same time? The nature of God or spirit, the thing itself, whatever name you choose to assign to the, your higher power, if that nature is peace, and harmony and love and we are all expressions of God how can we have murder and war and conflict and mass shootings and all of the things that are going on in our world today but we can look back to our class by the way the final projects in our class were absolutely outstanding uh, they are wow I didn't know quite what to expect because a lot of the people in the class were new to me. And I, I just salute them to have the courage and the vulnerability to look and deal with the things in their lives. So what's the principle if we've got this paradox? What is the principle that's behind it? It is oneness and love. Ernest Holmes, the search for divine unity, the realization of unity, necessitates the acceptance that there is no dividing line, that we shall expand, progress, evolve ad infinitum in a sequence from where we are now to any stage that we shall ever become. Out of eternal being comes everlasting becoming. The practices that we use to embrace both of these seeming opposites at the same time are compassion, forgiveness. Many times it begins with self-forgiveness and affirmative prayer. Ken Wilbur, somewhere in my notes here. Here we go. Ken Wilbur wrote when the opposites are realized to be one discord melts into concord battles into dances and old enemies become lovers we are then in a position to make friends with all of our universe and not just half of it we can become with ev one with everyone not just those who agree with us we can see beyond that. And if we're talking about affirmative prayer, 
I came across this. This is a prayer that Ernest Holmes wrote, and I find it deeply profound. So join me in prayer. There is a power for good in the universe, and it is moving in and through me this day to bring peace and harmony and good to all. The divine is everywhere present, especially and included in all spaces of war, conflict, and violence. We bless all who are impacted by conflict of any kind. We lift peace in the midst of war. We pray for healing and comfort where it is needed right now. In gratitude, we declare this truth collectively. And so it is. So what I want you to take away today, each of us has the ability to live our lives from the genius of the and. We must be willing to set down our preconceived ideas, old beliefs, cultural mindset, childhood patterns, and the and or thinking. And step into something brand new. Our teaching has cultivated fertile ground in our thinking to develop a natural paradox mindset. The mindset, remember the Janusian thinking, where we can hold those seeming opposites both at the same time. Using this mindset and our unique teaching, we will truly create and step into a world that works for everyone. The events of the past decade, including the swift ushering in of a new new normal, with COVID have all been acting as a catalyst to shift us away from our polarized thinking and into a third way of thinking. It is time for us to step up and live from potentiality and possibility rather than limitation. And so with this idea of our, our oneness, our wholeness, and the magnificent universe in which we live. I invite my colleagues, whether at home, whether here in the sanctuary, to join me in recognizing that there is indeed a power in the universe, a power for good in the universe. And that power is continually and forever expressing itself through and as each and every one of us. And even though we experience the things of this world, we can know that there is something greater and we can embrace that greater. We can see both sides of the coin and know that it is valuable. We know that this power in the universe is for us and it is good. And it is in every aspect of our lives. For those of us who are suffering from lack and limitation, more month than there is paycheck, not enough to live on, we can simply know that we do live in an abundant universe. And then when we are aligned we can see beyond the things and see the truth. The truth is that the permanent things are love. And that is permanent. For those of us that are experiencing health challenges, we can just simply know that there is disease, there is pain, there is suffering and we can also know and that that pain is there for a reason. That pain is there to let us know that something is wrong. That pain is there to tell us to slow down and rest up. We know that if our back is out that that rest period is here now. And I speak my word now for those who are feeling separation, separation from one another, whether it's because of political beliefs or religious beliefs or any other 
area of division that we can think of within our lives, cultural differences, those are absolutely nothing because the absolute truth is that we are all expressions of the one and the one is love and we can love one another when we have the courage to step out of the field of separation and into the field of oneness and love. Into the field of infinite possibilities. And so we just give thanks. We give thanks, we let it go, we let it be, and so it is.